It is almost 11 a.m. in Singapore and Shanghai. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets Asia. I'm Haslinda Amin. Here are the top stories. Hong Kong stocks slip as traders book profits following massive gains. The yen resuming its slide after Japan's new prime minister surprises with a warning to the BOJ against raising rates. OpenAI raises $6.6 billion in new funding. Investors including Microsoft and NVIDIA giving it a valuation of $157 billion. Also ahead, China's stimulus uh, package seen triggering a shift in global money away from current favorites such as Japan, Southeast Asia and India. And we get more on all of this with a great lineup of guests, including JP Morgan's head of EM Economics, Jahangir Aziz. Well, in the markets, Asia down for a second day. Investors probably mulling the implications of escalating tensions in the Middle East. We have oil up for a third day. Traders now batting on $100 oil as risks escalate. We've seen a flurry of crude options that pay out if prices hit that $100 mark. MSCI asia Pacific index down 7 tenths of 1%. The dollar index up about a tenth of 1%. And that's weighing on Asian currencies. Taking a look at where we are in terms of the Japanese yen, currently at 146 80, the yen uh, weakening on the back of Ishiba, saying that Japan is not yet ready for another BOJ hike. That is a surprise from the new prime minister. Well, let's get more on markets with Ranodeb Roy, founder, CEO and CIO of RV Capital, which manages $1 billion in fixed income assets across Asia. Also with us, Bloomberg M Life Executive Editor Mark Cardmore. Ron, Ron, let's start with you. We talk about how it is a higher vol environment, yet when you take a look at you know, the risk assets, they're not quite showing that volatility. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, uh, look, higher volatility could be because people want to buy calls as opposed to, you know, buy puts. So it could be either way. Uh, it is a bit surprising. But if you look at where vol levels are, or VIX levels are, they are high. They're higher than where they were, um, you know, a couple of years back or three years back. But, but they're not really that high. We're not at, you know, 25 or 30 vol. Right? So um, we think volatility could pick up. Uh, there could be potential. I mean, look, the three large economies are cutting rates, US, Europe, China. So there's a, essentially a possibility of a risk melt up. And I think the vol levels are showing those uh, signs. Mark, gold, bonds lower, dollar pretty much flat. Is it expected? I think uh, with the dollar being flat, I don't know whether we think I expected on what time span, but I'm, look, I'm bearish the dollar, I think, over the next coming months. I think we're going towards the bottom end of the, the dollar smile. Um, I think that gold can continue to do well overall. I do kind of agree with Ronnie that we you know, might get a bit of a risk melt up. The difference will be that it may not be as US focused. That's, I, I'm not bearish the US, but I think that China has given the green light for the rally to kind of broaden out and be elsewhere in the world. And you know, it may even be less China, Hong Kong focused, but more the, the derivative plays that go next. So we've had the first derivative of the China stimulus, but now we'll get some of the EM plays. And there's a lot of debate about there about whether the fiscal stimulus in China will ultimately feed through to the real economy. Um, but I don't think that matters right now. Now, this, this is very much targeted at the stock market. Whether the stock market changes consumer behavior or something for three months, six months down the line, my view is quite optimistic in that, as you know. Um, but I think that ultimately the stocks will be driven higher. And I still think we, we can get that second derivative of the stocks moving stock markets around the world. So I think we do get the risk melt up. I think dollar probably weakens as, as a result of re-leveraging back into the rest of the world, not necessarily about selling the dollar, but it's about seeking exposure elsewhere, no longer needing. There, there is an alternative to U.S. tech stocks, even though they'll do fine. The thing is, the risk is in oil, actually. We're, we have traders expecting $100 oil, and we know what $100 oil means for the stock market, for emerging economies in particular, the likes of India, the likes of uh, Southeast Asia. Yeah, the oil at 100 is, is bad for uh, emerging markets, uh, Asia, definitely. Uh, most of Asia are oil importers, so uh, that's a risk. Uh, but I think that's a tail risk. Uh, the market. Uh, the demand side globally softening is probably a better determinant of where oil will be next year as opposed to the current Middle East crisis. Yeah, it is inflationary. It must be a factor that the Fed considers as it decides on rate cuts. 
Uh, absolutely. I think, you know, I personally think that oil around the Middle East story is being misunderstood. I think, you know, we know this, that, you know, U.S. is now the biggest producer of oil in the world. We have so many other forms of energy that are much more serious. But we're still stuck in this mindset that, hey, if Iran and Iraq get shut off from oil, the whole world's going to end, you know, because we still think of this, you know, remember the 70s. Um, and, you know, it is true that if the Straits of Hormuz are, is blocked, that's going to be problematic. But, you know, there are so many alternative sources of energy, and not just crude, but other sources of energy, that it's going to be less of a problem. I would have been quite bearish oil, except for the fact that because I'm optimistic on the China stimulus, I think that actually the demand supply can be, get better. We've talked a lot this year about the, the negativity in markets and economics, and we've talked about this a lot, has that I think everyone's way too bearish the global economy. The fact is the global economy is going to grow at 3% or more again this year. U.S. economy looks like it's going faster this year than last year, despite everyone talking about this mythical slowdown that's just not happening. And into that, the central bank is easing again and providing another impulse of positivity. So the demand side might drive oil higher. And actually, I'm curious, Ronnie, in your view about whether you think, like, if you, if you say where oil is going to go for, we've been relatively stable around the $70 mark. It doesn't matter whether you're looking at Brent, WTI, and the broader perspective. Do you think that, that, that oil will next go to $90 or $50? Like, do you think the real, the bigger risk is a big move upside or big move downside in oil? Well, uh, I don't know about immediately, but the big picture, as you rightly you know, hit the nail on the head, the dependency of oil over medium to long term is going to go down. Uh, and, and I think many economies have risk mitigated themselves against oil shocks of the past, right? So even India did a pretty good job in the last two, three years where people thought they would get affected by oil higher. Uh, so I think there's a chance of 50 uh, as opposed to 100. Um, and, and, um, you know, and we've seen that many times as soon as the economy starts slowing down. Look, U.S. has had, as you rightly pointed out, has had a spectacular run over the last you know, few years, but that doesn't mean it continues, right? And oil, of course, is a nominal GDP story. So as inflation comes down, nominal GDP growth starts slowing down, and that impacts oil as well. Middle East and oil, one factor to consider in the markets. The other thing is Japan. Oh, what a surprise. Ishiba saying, you know what, it is not time uh, to, to, to raise rates further. That is, uh, that's taken the market by surprise, Ronnie. Well, that's always the tension between politicians and central bankers, right? So central bankers want to do the right thing by economics, and politicians always want a protracted, long-run, you know, easy money policy, right? So, uh, and of course, the Nikkei had corrected, so the first few days uh, in his term, of course, he's going to be uh, sounding dovish. But I think uh, with Japan rates at, uh, you know, close to negative two and a half, and I agree with you, Mark, in terms of Japan will potentially always remain negative interest rates, but down two and a half, where wage negotiations are at five percent, uh, there's probably room for another fifty to hundred base points hikes in the next, you know, year, year and a half. But it's going to be gradual, which is what Japan believes in. I'm curious, but if you think we can do another fifteen hundred base points in Bank of Japan over what time span? Is that like over the next nine months? And 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 if so. You know, how much can the yen appreciate and how do you think you play the yen trade? I mean, obviously, when, if you do dollar yen, dollar is a much more volatile component, so it seems like a less clean way to play it. So if you want to play a bullish yen view, what's your short for that? Oh, it's a great question. So we've been playing uh, the, sh the, the long yen view through one yen um, uh, and euro yen to take the dollar leg out of it, right? So in both cases, we think they are, you know, long-term extremes from a fair value perspective. And the reason why we use one yen is Korea and Japan have very similar goods, uh, uh, basket of goods and services that it ex exports and imports. So, so that's a, a really good parallel to use. It also is a great risk off currency. I, you know, uh, as a macro fund manager, we're always thinking of which parts of the security uh, spectrum will, you know, perform really well in a huge risk off. And one yen is one such, right? So if you look at what happened in August, like one yen went from nine to nine and a half, right? Uh, very, very quickly in a few days. So uh, I think one yen is, a, is the way to do it. So valuation-wise, it's, it's in your favor. And from a risk-off perspective, it's a great trade to own. So long yen versus one. And I'm just wondering how that might play out for the other, the other currencies in Asia, including the yuan. Well, yuan is, a, is, a, is an interesting one. Like macroeconomic policies say, like we've learned from Abenomics, you know, if you do uh, policy stimulus from a monetary perspective, uh, you buy as much assets as you can to, you know, put a floor to asset prices in China, then the currency should depreciate, right? But China is, 
uh, oftentimes uh, a classic emerging market economy as well. And emerging market economy, in these kind of cases when equities rally, uh, the currencies rally as well. So the long dollar China trade is not potentially going to work in this environment of you know risk melt up in China. What do you make of the slew of stimulus that we've seen from China? Is it convincing enough for you? Yeah, that's a great question. So in many of our previous newsletters we've written about it, we've said if and when China does something like TARP, you know, uh, 08, Geithner, uh, Bernanke, or does something like Abenomics in 2012, um, you know, or Draghi in 2012, then uh, it lines up for a long China equity trade. And, you know, in the last, whatever, 72 hours or so, we've, we've seen all of them happen at the same time, right? So, so absolutely, um, this is probably uh, a good trade. I'm not saying it's a structural change in the story. It can happen if we see more follow-throughs. Uh, but it's definitely a tactical uh, long China risk asset story. From, from here, given that we've already seen just extraordinary gains in Hong Kong stocks and Chinese stocks, what do you think is the single best way to play it into year end, that, that specifically that China stimulus trade? Yeah, so uh, uh, we have, I mean, we are a fixed income shop, so I wish, uh, I would say, long China equities, but which I think is a cleaner trade. Uh, but we have bought some convertibles of restructured, already restructured credit stories uh, to begin with, uh, some semi-distressed bonds which are still performing in the property space, some high-yield bonds in the non-property space, and in the interest rate uh, side, it's, it's, it's a steepener, it's a cleaner trade in my opinion, because China needs to probably issue more bonds in the long end, they'll keep the long end part of the curve slightly where it is or even potentially higher, and, and the short end needs to cut even more. The opposite of Japan, is China real rates, if you take PPI as, a, as an input variable as opposed to CPI, because China is a manufacturing story ultimately, uh, it's still 1.5% uh, real rate, positive real rate. So they have more room to cut. And so they have more dry power on that, that side. So a steeper yield curve. Uh, Ronnie, I want to get your views on how you assess risk, because it is, we've seen a confluence of factors that we've never seen before in our lifetime. And I know that you were in New York when the um, global financial crisis happened. Has that influenced and shaped the way you look at risk now? No, I, I was in New York the year before. So I came back to Asia in March 07, thankfully. Uh, um, but yes, the, the, the size of the train wreck that was hurtling towards the financial world in, uh, you know, 07, 08 was, was pretty evident to me because I came back to Asia in, 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 in 07 and uh, I was trading Asian markets during the 08 crisis. Absolutely, it is definitely a framework to look at it, and, uh, and which is why the, the story and how China comes out out of this property, I mean, almost all big crises in the world are a real estate crisis, right, whether you look at you know, the U.S. in 08 or, you know, Japan for the last, you know, 30 odd years, pre-abenomics, um, as well as, you know, Spain, uh, which was an epicenter of property crisis in Europe in 2011, uh, Greece and Spain. Uh, they're all property crisis and they all get solved by not the government buying property, but buying all other assets that makes cash, you know, really difficult to hold on to and, you know, and that improves cons consumer sentiment and ultimately it, it trickles down uh, to properties. I, I'm interested that you, you know, you're buying some of those kind of property related bonds. And I know it's like, it's where there's the most uh, juice in the trade in the short term. Um, but I would have thought that whatever your perspective is in the stimulus, it's unlikely to be as quick a turnaround in the property sector. So even if you're quite positive that it feeds to the real economy, even and therefore a bottoming in the property sector, property market in China is not going to suddenly turn into a, a, a sustainable long-term bull market. Um, and, and therefore, even though you get the juice in the returns, do you think the volatility justifies it? You need to absolutely size it, you know, uh, as a portion of your portfolio in a very uh, practical manner. It can't be, you know, uh, our, our sizing right now in the property sector is probably 3 to 5% of the entire fund. Okay. Right? And that can generate three to five percent returns, right? <laughs> so it can double. Yeah. Uh, but, but you have to choose them carefully. It's not the ones that are zero to 10 cents of the dollar because that's a long-term structuring, restructuring story. It's the ones that are, you know, 60 to 80, they've showed intent in terms of repayment, they have some finance lines. After all this that, is, that has been announced, it's difficult to see that the top two or three property companies now default in the debt, right? So, so it's, it's a trade from potentially 60 to 80 cents 
uh, that is that is the trade uh, in in front of us. Right? It's not the ones uh, between zero to ten cents in the dollar, which could also potentially do well if this is a structural, you know, uh, turnaround story. So, Ronnie, one final question: What would it take for a proper turnaround in China's property sector? Uh, this uh, medicine that's been given to the market needs to continue for a long period of time. As we saw, you know, Abenomics 2012, you know, the Nikkei has now gone from 10,000 to 40,000, right? And things in Japan, we are talking about rate hikes and things of that nature, and it's happened already. People never thought that was possible. Um, it'll take a sustained, um, you know, stimulus to continue uh, and potentially increase in size. The good news is, there's, an, there's been an ideological shift as well. So uh, the Politburo and the president essentially talked about in the past that property prices are too high. And when I walked around my trading room and asked mainland Chinese in my, uh, in my company, they couldn't afford housing in Shanghai or some of these top tier towns even after earning in Sing dollars, right? So, um, so there was a problem uh, at the ground level. Now, obviously, progress have come down. They're not gone down to you know 20 cents on the dollar, but sales of property have gone to 20 cents on the dollar. So, so there's been almost an 80 percent, uh, you know, over a four-year period, uh, down number of real uh, new sales that's happening, and that of course impacts the supply, uh, and therefore, and and most of the stimulus measures that has been um, addressed has been demand side. So now. It'll take, it'll take time, obviously. Uh, and of course, there was no need to have 50 large private sector property companies to, uh, to build properties in, in a demographic which is shrinking. So, so all those corrections have started to happen. I think, I think the top tier ones, especially the SOEs, as well as the top tier private sector, will probably gain market share from here. All right, Ronnie, great insights. Thank you so much for that. Ronnie Roy of RV Capital Management and Bloomberg M Life Executive Editor Mark Cutmore with the insights today. Well, still to come, we'll discuss the outlook for emerging markets, including India, in light of the sudden surge in Chinese stocks. JP Morgan's head of EM Economics Research will be joining us live later this hour. Anand Rati shares and stockbrokers will also be sharing their views. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. OpenAI has completed a deal to raise $6.6 billion in new funding. This latest round takes the AI company's valuation to $160 billion or close to that. For more, let's bring in a tech reporter, Annabelle Drillers in Hong Kong and Bell. OpenAI now well and truly one of the most valuable startups in the world. Yeah, has you're talking about the top three here. So uh, OpenAI, then there's SpaceX, the, the, the parent company of TikTok, ByteDance. So a very, very exclusive club, you might say. But what's happened here is we've had another fundraising round and, and some of the key details here, well, it was led by Thrive Capital. They tipped in about $1.3 billion of that 6.6. .6. We're also hearing from sources that Microsoft contributed $750 million. Uh, they have been the biggest backer to date. Others include Coastal Ventures, Tiber Global. In Asia, we heard uh, SoftBank, for instance, there was reports that they were looking at handing over $500 million. We actually just had Masayoshi's son speaking at a company investor day. He didn't announce anything there, but uh, he wouldn't typically actually announce any sort of investment deals either. So it's sort of in the tune of that. But still, it, it tells you that the tech industry as a whole is continuing to believe in the, in the power of AI and what's ahead. But the question, of course, is, how does OpenAI plan to use such such funds, such a large cash pile? And what the company has said, because they put out a statement, is that they're looking to, to put it toward AI research and also scaling up their compute capacity. Uh, huge valuation, certainly a level that's really transfixing many among uh, Silicon Valley. Of course, sound, uh, sounding a note of caution bell, we've heard warnings on these kinds of sky-high valuations. 
Yeah, that's right, Has It's certainly not <laughs> impressing everyone equally. Actually, one of the most read stories we've had has been Bloomberg's interview with Deron Asimoglu. Asimoglu is a well-known MIT uh, professor. He, he's basically, yeah, poured, poured a little bit of cold water on all of this optimism here. So at a time when you can see here just how much AI-related stocks have been outpacing the border bark moves. I mean, that line in white is NVIDIA there. You've got Broadcom and Meta in Bloomberg blue and yellow, and then at the bottom, the S&P 500, which has still done well, but nothing close to what we see in those specific tech names. He is saying that actually, despite all the speculation we see from industry to industry, how many jobs are going to be replaced, he says only 5% will be disrupted by AI, and so he's looking for three different scenarios here. The first is that the tech mania uh, fizzles out, essentially, slowly over the next year or so. The second is that actually the frenzy continues to build over this time horizon and then we have a tech stock crash. And then in the third scenario he's talking about companies continue to invest heavily in AI. They uh, essentially remove workers who they then need to rush to rehire when big company bosses essentially figure out that AI technology is not living up or isn't working as they expected. What Asimoglu is saying is that a combination of two and three is the most likely scenario here, and those together could lead to some widespread economic issues. So certainly, as we say, it has a, a note of caution. All right. Annabelle Drulis, we thank you so much for that. Now, let's get back to markets. Do a check on uh, Hong Kong. Uh, markets there cooling after the gains that we saw in recent days. Of course, uh, it's uh, rallying. Traders uh, pretty much taking profit at this point in time. The Hang Seng Index down by more than 4%. The uh, Hang Seng Tech Index lower by uh, 7% right now. We're keeping an eye in particular on the uh, China Enterprise Index. Uh, after 13 straight sessions of gains, it is uh, under pressure. Of course, we've from the likes of JP Morgan saying, you know what, be careful uh, of chasing those gains so far. It is high risk, it is sentiment driven, and we're seeing uh, that pullback today as traders take profit at this point in time. Of course, uh, we're keeping an eye on that uh, enterprises index currently down by 4.7%. Plenty more ahead. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. the market has to uh, assess what is the risk, a uh, realistic risk uh, of uh, supplies from the Middle East getting affected. At this point, that's really minimal. The focus is, uh, remains on uh, demand and uh, quite a pessimistic view of demand, certainly in, in China, but definitely in, in Europe and to some extent the U.S. as well. So when the dust settles down on this Middle East uh, issues, I would expect uh, market attention to go back to demand, which uh, exerts a downward pressure on crude prices. And that was Vanda Insights founder Vanda Nahari speaking with us about the impact of the Middle East crisis and oil. And speaking of oil, continues to trade higher. Brent crude up by about 1%. New York crude higher by 1.2%. Oil up for a third day. Trade is now betting of $100 oil on escalating risks in the Middle East. Let's do a check as well on uh, what's happening in Hong Kong. The Hang Seng Index trending lower as we speak down by more than 4%. The Enterprises Index index also are trending lower, down by 4.6%. China stocks in Hong Kong cooling on the back of that rally, which we saw uh, recently. Of course, we heard from the likes of JP Morgan saying, be careful. It is pretty much risk driven. And we're seeing investors taking money off the table. Plenty more ahead. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg.
China on holiday by Chinese stocks trading in Hong Kong are under a lot of pressure at this point in time. Taking a look at where we are in terms of the Hang Seng Index down by more than 4 percent. We're keeping an eye on the China Enterprises Index, uh, which is down by more than 4 percent, but not yet touching that 5 percent level, which we indicated earlier on the show. And in terms of the uh, BI China Developers Index uh, down by 14 percent. But remember that we've seen that index surge by almost 30 percent percent yesterday. So some money off the table in terms of that uh, rally of Chinese stocks in Hong Kong. Investors are mulling and perhaps uh, taking money off the table. Uh, on the back as well of the JP Morgan warning saying be careful. It is uh, pretty much uh, sentiment driven when it comes to that rally we're seeing in Chinese stocks in Hong Kong. Well, let's get more analysis on the shifts we're beginning to see across markets and bringing Asia equities reporter Winnie Xu Winnie, a bit of a pullback in Hong Kong markets today, a blip or a wider trend, or is this, is, is this rally over? Right, like you said, it seems like we're seeing some reversal in sentiment today. Um, the HSCI is down now the most in about two years, so it's quite a big swing from what we saw yesterday or even for the past 13, 13 days. Um, yesterday, actually, the index was up the most in two years. So that you know the, the rally has been boosted by so much by that momentum and by that optimism around the stimulus and further stimulus even so while we're seeing um, that that kind of strong uh, that that kind of uh, improvement in sentiment we're also seeing some overheat uh, in the market so when you look at um, the the RSI level it's actually uh, the index has been in the overbought um, range uh, for the past two weeks so investors are saying that it's natural that we're seeing some um, some healthy correction and it does provide uh, more opportunities for some um, traders to jump into the rally um, to buy some of the dips but others say that um, you know while we, we see um, the the index actually um, at the, the level that we saw um, Pre, um, when when uh, the market actually exited COVID. So um, that might show that um, lots of investors are still not convinced that um, the economic turnaround is ready to happen. So we will be um, watching if there's more catalysts for the market, including um, if sentiments are going to turn um, after the holiday, if we're going to see uh, consumer confidence to come back and if the government is going to continue to push for more policies and to implement those policies. It does seem like sentiment has turned for hedge funds. The China rally boosting returns for, for those bullish. Yes, so lots of hedge funds that bet right on China um, saw a lot of um, their, their profits surging for, you know, over 25 percent in just September. Um, and our data has really showed that that um, that that they were able to profit from that. And I remember uh, talking to Men Group, um, the world's biggest hedge fund, right when, right before uh, China had this uh, stimulus package, and they were t telling me how um, the valuation looks very attractive for China, and that they believe that more stimulus has to happen uh, for for China to rescue uh, the current economic situation. So that actually played pretty well for them. So we're seeing lots of. Uh, hedge funds really seizing that opportunity uh, to jump into the market that is seeing still very low valuation, attractive valuation, and um, a highly underweight um, portfolio within the, uh, the, the regional funds. Uh, Winnie, you've got to wonder what the China rally means for other Asian favorite markets, the likes of Taiwan, Japan, India. Right. Unfortunately, in order for for the um, for investors to fund for um, putting more money into China, they have to take money out of some of their other uh, regional bets, and that, as you mentioned, includes some of the other uh, emerging markets. So some of the smaller Asian markets. And uh, Macquarie the other day had a note saying that at this moment, um, India looks less attractive uh, due to the high valuation, while they see uh, more upside sites for China stocks. So there potentially is also uh, the rotation 
from India uh, to China. But what really stands out is um, the rotation from Japan uh, to China, because earlier in the year when we saw that rally in Japanese stocks, people were saying that, oh, it's time to ditch China and rotate uh, into Japan. So we're seeing that fund flow to reverse right now. And JP Morgan this morning just had a note talking about that trend. Uh, they're saying that um, while we're seeing that trend to continue uh, for the time being, um, it will actually require uh, seeing more uh, specific stimulus from China to come in order for that trend to sustain further. Uh, so we are continuously watching uh, how much more funds um, out of Japan and into China is going to happen. All right, definitely some rotation there. HR equities reporter Winnie Shu, thank you. Let's talk more about Indian markets and the risk they face from China's rally. Tanvi Kanchan is head of strategy at Anand Rathi Shares and Stockbrokers is with us. Tanvi, your thoughts? Are we seeing that rotation from uh, India to China? Thank you so much for having me. Uh, we are, I mean, last week, if you saw, there was a 1,300 uh, drop that, uh, you know, we witnessed in the major indices over here. And primarily because uh, on the backs of the stimuli that Chinese economy is currently facing. Uh, but one thing that we need to also notice is the fact that there was a substantial amount of inflows that happened in the Indian markets. Now, taking purely on valuation, that is large, mid and small, on the mid and small cap, Indian markets are at a fairly overvalued space in comparison to Chinese markets. Uh, we were somewhere at a 3x in terms of just pure valuation on a comparison side. Uh, so you will see a certain level of knee-jerk reaction. Uh, but majority from the EM space, uh, I think... Uh, as you know, we have seen the Japanese markets have had a far higher outflow in comparison to what the Indian markets have seen. Uh, throughout the uh, times that we will go through now, I believe that the Indian markets would not have a substantial amount of outflow in comparison to the other EM stocks while the whole rotation in major ports. Uh, Indian stocks are also somewhere fundamentally uh, in line with the long-term averages. So if you consider large cap, it's somewhere currently at a PE of 23.6, whereas if you take a five-year forward PE, they were at about 22.7. So large caps are fairly at a decently valued space. Mid and small is where you are signing at an overvalued space, where you can have a substantial amount of outflow from FII or FBI money. Right. I'm just wondering, in terms of uh, returns, what kind of returns can we expect? Because when you take a look at Nifty uh, 50, we've seen returns of about 15 percent. What are you anticipating for maybe for, for, for the coming 12 months? Uh, yeah, Nifty has kind of delivered like a 14.85 uh, percent returns just in the first half of the year. Uh, keeping in line the current fundamentals, we have seen the trade deficit number being much better than what it was uh, last year. Even the balance of payments shows positive indicators with regards to strong FDI inflow. Uh, just purely on large cap, we are still expecting the kind of inflow to happen and the positivity to remain. Uh, DIIs are continuing to have a very good inflow. We have something called a systematic investment that goes into the markets every month, which has seen a very substantial growth uh, uh, you know, you're standing at about 2.8 billion of uh, monthly inflows just from domestic in, uh, investors happening. So at purely fundamental and at a purely, uh, you know, large cap indices driven uh, rally, we can kind of see the markets be somewhere in the 14, 15% return, uh, if not what, uh, you know, the uh, broader large cap delivered last year at 2025. Uh, mid and small cap uh, at a purely YOY was still in the range of 35 to 50%. Uh, we do expect a certain level of, uh, you know, kind of a substantiated uh, growth at about 20% to 25% in that space. So there will be a certain level of subdued returns in comparison to last year. But again, positive on a broader level fundamentals on Indian markets. So how should your portfolio look like, Tanvi? I mean, you should be reducing, I guess, exposure to your uh, mid and small caps then. Absolutely. Uh, at a portfolio level, uh, 
as I mentioned, large caps are still in line with your long-term averages. So on a broader portfolio, somewhere at a three to five uh, year perspective, positive on large cap, having a very strong hold on large cap. I, in comparison to mid and small cap, mid is uh, fairly at an overvalued space. So mid cap Nifty 150 PE is standing at about 44.8 and uh, the long-term average of about five is at about 28.7. So mid cap is fairly higher valued in comparison to even small cap. So small cap current long-term is at about 32 and a half, whereas the long-term average at five year was at 32.6. So large and small cap are still at, uh, you know, in line with their long term averages. However, mid cap has had a very huge overvaluation right. in most of their portfolio. So, yeah, uh, much, size. Tanvi, how much potential do you see in the financial sector, which have pretty much underperformed? Uh, financial sector would be a very good contrarian view to have in your portfolio. In terms of sector, I completely uh, agree that there has been a very substantial underperformance. But keeping in line the current uh, RBI policies as well, we expect financial sector to have a good contrarian play in broader level portfolio. So if someone wants to have... Uh, you know, a contrarian bet, uh, a sector that was at an undervalued space, financial sector is, is a good hold in the portfolios. Tanvi, thank you so much for that. Tanvi Kanchan, Head of Strategy at Anand Rati Shares and Stock Brokers. Plenty more ahead. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Beirut and traders uh, mulling implications of that intensifying war or rather conflict in the Middle East. Oil on the back of that up for a third day. Traders uh, batting oil getting to $100 but not today. Brent crude at $74.68. New York crude at $70.92. Of course, we've seen a flurry of crude options that pay out if prices hit $100 a barrel. Also hedging uh, against a spike in oil prices. That is front and center on investors' mind. Well, welcome back to Bloomberg Markets Asia. We are uh, watching the India-focused segment. A look at Indian markets ahead of the open just ahead. Trepidation. Stocks look set for a subdued start this morning as traders return from Wednesday's holiday amid escalating tensions that we just talked about in the Middle East. Uh, foreign funds extending the selling streak for a third day, possibly driven by that massive rally that we've seen in Chinese equities, China on holiday. But of course, uh, we have Chinese stocks uh, trading in Hong Kong. Uh, property stocks in particular in Hong Kong has led that rally. Uh, today, though, uh, those stocks are pretty much uh, under pressure, investors uh, taking profit. Let's bring in our next guest, Jahangir Aziz, is head of EM Economics Research at JP Morgan. Good to have you with us. Good to be back. It does seem like there's been a, a change in sentiment towards of course, China. Of course. I mean, uh, especially you know, if you compare things today compared to last three months, today we now have a Fed that is surprises with a 50 basis points of rate cut instead of a 25 basis points of rate cut. We have ECB continuing to ease and then, lo and behold, things that we had been waiting for for some time, that China to start putting some amount of stimulus into the economy. Um, I think all of, the, all of these things taken together probably makes life much better for emerging markets going forward. Of course, we have to contend with the U.S. election risks, but leaving that aside, I think this is a very, very strong runway for emerging markets. But the thing is, one, they say it is great for emerging markets, but two, perhaps it'll take money investments away from emerging markets. That's been the case over the last two, three years, right? Emerging, if you look at emerging market ex China, this has been a remarkable performance of emerging market as far as macro is concerned. Imagine the shocks that hit emerging markets. We started with COVID in a, in a set of countries that didn't have a public health care system that could even cope, something like that. Then you got hit with the Ukraine war and the oil price spiking. Then you got hit by 500 basis points of rate hike by the Fed. Then you got hit by China, who was in a lockdown. And when the reopening started, it was a very dis disappointing reopening. Yet, there isn't a single emerging market today that is even close to a financial crisis. I'm talking about the larger ones. Mm -hmm. Hark back to 2013, there was a whisper that Ben Bernanke bed one day might decide to reduce QE and five went into financial crisis. 
So compare it to the history of emerging market, emerging markets over the last three years has done a remarkable performance on the back of it. Capital hasn't flowed into it in to chase that growth because we've had U.S. exceptionalism. Mm. One remarkable emerging market has been India, of yes. course. It's become the favorite sure. for every investor. With China showing urgency, with China showing a willingness to reverse, uh, you know, its economy, do you see money now, you know, coming out of India, going into China? So that was, the, it's a reversal of the long India, short China play that was in play for the last two years, where we've seen MSCI index, where India's weight goes up and China's weight go, comes down. With one particular set of policy measures, I'm not talking about the macro policy measures or the housing measures, just the fact that PBOC is now willing to provide liquidity for firms to buy back debt or for mutual funds to go back into the, in the equity market. Clearly, there has been a rally, and as long as the PBOC's generosity keeps on flowing in, that rally probably has some legs to stand. And in this rally, I'm sure that there will be some repositioning away from China into, uh, away from India into China. However, we have to wait and see whether or not organically Chinese equity markets can continue rather than just getting this boost. And that is where I think concerns are. At the end of the day, you can't get an organic rally in any asset prices unless you get nominal GDP, which is sort of the way in which we benchmark earnings, continuing to go up. In fact, what we have seen over the last two years, and I don't think any of the policy changes that China has done reverses our view that nominal GDP, real GDP will be held back, but nominal GDP will continue to slow down because it doesn't do very much to deflation either domestically, neither do these measures do anything for uh, deflation externally, i.e. export price deflation. So what nominal GDP are you expecting for China? So we have 4.6% four four in real GDP growth rate. We have not changed our views about 2024 real GDP growth rate on the back of all of these things to us. All that the macro policy measures, the 50 basis points of reserve requirement cut, the 20 basis points of the reverse repo cuts, and on the back of that, probably one and a half, 1.8 trillion RMB of additional bonds that will be most likely be issued. All it does is takes away the fourth quarter downside risk, which was very, very high. So on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, we actually expect Q3 growth rate to be 3% quarterly, not in year and year, mm -hmm. and move up to about 5, 5.5 to give the year about 4.5. On the other hand, we continue to see deflation continuing both in the domestic front and, and on the external front, and we are looking at a 4, maybe even slightly less than a 4 handle in nominal GDP. But if that's the run rate, and you've seen profitability fall very sharply even last month. We need to see more evidence that there can be organic drivers of asset prices in China. Jangir, you've been talking about how resilient emerging markets yes. have been despite the environment that we are Absolutely. in right now, or have been. The thing is, people are now focused on oil prices, yes. perhaps some factoring in uh, oil no. price at 100 bucks a barrel. That is negative for a lot of emerging markets, the likes of India. I think probably in the market is, you know, overreacting or to all of this. Look, up until... But are we underpricing the risk in the Middle East? So let's take what is the risk. There is about, not exactly, numbers are not exactly clear, but somewhere between one and a half to two million barrels a day that Iran potentially supplies to the world market, mostly allegedly to China. So the question is, so let's say that two million barrels a day does not reach China because of the conflict. What does China do to compensate for the two million barrels a day? Most likely, China is unlikely to come to the open market with all the two million barrels a day. Most, it has massive amounts of reserves that it has accumulated over the past two, three years. Let's say, I'm just making up these numbers. Let's say we split the difference, they come to the market with one million barrel a day and they use reserves for the other million barrel a day. One million barrel a day does not put the market in excess demand. It just about balances the current excess supply that you've seen in the market. And this is not including 
OPEC Plus's threat of actually going back and not cutting as much and this thing that. If OPEC does that, you are still going to get the market in excess supply. So you can get a knee-jerk reaction. I'm not saying that you can't get a knee-jerk reaction where something happens, people out of fear push oil prices to 100, but it's very, very hard to see that the absence of 1 million barrel a day from global demand puts oil prices to 100 when the oil market remains structurally in excess supply. So you say less perhaps than a 50% chance of oil getting to 100 if we see an escalation? Look, I, it's, a, it's a terrible thing to ask an economist about <laughs> oil prices or asset prices. We are terrible at predicting all of these things. But it looks, you can get, as I said, you can get one day, one fine morning, you get, you know, uh, oil prices going to 100. But it's very hard to see that sustaining beyond a few, peer, few, few, few days, right? Because the, because the market is structurally in excess supply. Another risk for economies <coughs> here yep. would be the U.S. election. Yes, of course. And that promise of additional tariffs yes. on China. That will have ripple effects. That, to us, is the critical risk at this point in time. The risk is that if we do get an escalation of tariffs on China, Look, the numbers that have been floating around by, the, by, by President Trump and President Trump's campaign range from 50 to 200 percent. So let's take a number which has been repeated on and off, which is 60 percent tariff. Currently, the effective tariff on China is about 20 percent. You raise effective tariff on 20 percent to 60 percent, then the implied dollar CNY is almost a 30 percent depreciation in that. Right now, with all the stimulus, et cetera, and what's happened after the yen carry trade got unwind, we are looking at dollar CN by breaking, going below seven. Hmm. You could have a scenario on November 8 when the market starts looking at dollar CNY going more, moving to more towards eight than towards to breaking seven. And I think that is a major shock because it means that every other manufacturing exporter in this region name anyone, India, Korea, Taiwan, everybody, their currencies immediately get appreciated against CNY by that same amount. Mm. And that appreciation is going to be very, very hard to undo and remain, keep competitiveness, at the same time balance our financial stability, etc. So I think it is not just tariffs being imposed in China. It's a spillover effects that happens to the rest of the rest of the region right. that is significant. 2018-19 was about the spillover effects. It wasn't US-China trade war where US and China were badly affected. If you look at the impact, they both both sides basically absorbed it. Who didn't absorb it? It's the rest of the country, the rest of the world. Jahangir, thank you so much. Always a pleasure to have you in the studio. Jahangir Aziz, head of EM Economics Research at JP Morgan. Plenty more ahead. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Well, Indian stocks extending the loss for the day. The Sensex down by 9 tenths of 1 percent. Losses due for the Nifty. A Nifty Bank Index also in negative territory as traders uh, start this morning returning from that Wednesday holiday amid that escalating tensions in the Middle East. Remember that oil is trending higher for a third day, possibly uh, a factor that traders are considering uh, in the market. India, of course, uh, imports almost all of its uh, oil needs. The Hang Seng under pressure. Down uh, 3 percent. H S tag down more than 5 percent. A reversal of that rally which we have seen in recent days. That is it from Bloomberg Markets Asia.